So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for reminding us that we can do hard things with your help, especially our great example of Jesus. And so, Lord, I ask you to bless us and remind us of the bounty and abundance of your love for us and that you are with us when we do hard things. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's kids say, Amen. For God spotting. And we have some people who haven't been here for a little bit, so let's talk about what God spotting is. It's an opportunity for us to share when we have seen God active in the world and in our lives in the last few weeks, or maybe it's one that suddenly you remembered. But I've been thinking myself, um, again, you know, last week I talked about my dog. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the dog again. The dog is a big thing in my life right now. And uh, what I, of course, am just reminded over and over again is, you know, this is a dog that now knows me for two weeks. And yet I am the best thing since sliced bread. Let me tell you. That dog is like, oh, oh, oh. You know, and so first thing in the morning when he gets out of his crate, he jumps on the bed and licks our faces. And I just think, you know, that is how, I think our pets allow us to have that experience of realizing just how much God loves us. You know, that unconditional, you know, like you are the best thing that ever happened. You know, your picture is in, on God's refrigerator because God loves you that much. And that's this week just being reaffirmed this morning as the dog jumps on the bed at 6 a.m. And I'm thinking, why is the dog on the bed? And, and then I get the cold nose in my cheek and in my ear and a big lick. And I'm like, okay, I know why the tongue is here. But just remembering that unconditional love that God has for us. And, and again, what a blessing our pets are to us. And how glad I am that Max is part of our family. So does anybody else have a, a God sighting this week? That, something that uh, we're, was clear that God was present don't be bashful. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> okay, my God sighting, uh, number one, I uh, Gary and I got to meet Max the Great Basset uh, this weekend, and I love dogs so much, and I, I just know how they love us unconditionally. And we brought Max a little toy, and t uh, Max was just enthralled with this toy, and it was tested by my dog, Rella, and it has survived for quite a while. So that was really special. I just know God has given us these great pals to love and be a part of our home. And I'm looking at you, Julie, and her two new little kitties that she's got, and what joy they're bringing her. I've just been such a dog person personally. And then my neighbor this week uh, brought home a husky, an eight-year-old dog that's being rescued from California. Wow. And this dog uh, is named Hunter. It's a female um, husky. Haven't met it yet, but I had a little sign on their door when they came home with a toy for Hunter. So I can't wait to see and meet this new pal to bring them joy. They have been waiting to get, to get this dog and bring him, her, home. So dogs can be a joy and a gift from God is how I feel. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Glenn. Now you're in trouble. Glenn uh, was at that breakfast. <laughs> one of the things um, I do in the work in the Synod is for congregations transition, we have to ask the question of discernment. What has God been with us in the past? Where is God with us now? What does God want to do with in the future? And congregations have a hard time figuring that out. But one of the issues is, is we don't ask that questions ourselves. What does God those three questions. And so I've been asking that question myself. What does God need me to do besides being a coach for congregations in transition? Does God need me to do something else? So I've been discerning for about a couple of months. Okay. And, and camping group is it. No. Uh, <laughs> what, I, what I heard, interestingly enough, was that I didn't need to do more 
that my calling right now at this particular moment in the lives, I am a house husband, and my calling right now is to support her and her position. <laughs> because she went to a half-time job, and so I get to be house husband. And actually what that did, and then I'll, I'll give this back to you. This is a good sermon illustration you use elsewhere. Um, <laughs> the, what it did is it moved it from, I didn't mind doing it, from a chore or a job into a little bit of a calling, and it's changed my attitude. Mm. Yeah. So there's something for you to think about. <laughs> and I almost didn't share it, but I realized if we don't start sharing stories about discerning what God might want us to do, how can we encourage anybody else to do it? <laughs> Very good. We're we're practicing good hygiene here. <laughs> Anyone else have a God spotting this week? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> well, and my role with the Synod, I'm working with not only the Grand Canyon Synod, but the Rocky Mountain Synod. So I sort of coordinate Congregations that are in transition help look for candidates, leaders, pastors, and deacons looking for new calls and do some of the initial matching. And um, But in part of that process, I've been the privilege to participate in two groups of congregations in Rocky Mountain Synod, one in El Paso and there's one in Wyoming, um, if I'm remembering right. They are starting to have conversations about how do we partner and what does partnership look like and how do we work together to fill the needs of the community, but then also to fill the needs of the congregations as well. So it's interesting to see how the spirit is moving in these congregations and they're just at the beginning stages, but they're starting to figure out we are better together when we're not staying by ourselves but that we are part of a larger church and what can we do? What more can we do when we partner with other congregations? Mm -hmm. Another sermon illustration. <laughs> Anyone else with a God spotting this week? We're done with this one. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one more week. I feel that every day is a God spotting. At my age, I thank God every day for the day. And I look around, and God has made such beautiful things in this world. All the hate and that's going on and with the Russia thing and everything. You look for the beautiful things in the day. Mm -hmm. And that's God spottings to me. Mm -hmm. And God gave me a dog. <laughs> this is very true. I had lost my uh, Australian Shepherd. It was a huge dog. <laughs> and he was, he was a big dog. And he, uh, he lived till he was 15. And that's very old. And he needed to go to dog heaven. And so... A couple of weeks after I lost him, Barbie Harlib, who used to come to this church, called me and said, I've got a dog for you. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> well, I went out to see her. And I don't know what she is. She's part lab, and I don't know what the rest is. But I just, she came home with me, of course. And uh, she walked in and said, well, I've got it good here, so... That's it. And she's been there for, what, six months now? Mm -hmm. She's the most wonderful dog. She only has one bad habit. She does not like my grandson. <laughs> and Oops. some people say it's a good thing. <laughs> but I'm so blessed to have her. And that was given to me by God. Yeah, her name is Daisy May. Daisy May. Yep. <laughs> Anyone else? A story to share?
Thank you, Jivalate. Let us pray. Dear Father, Mother, Creator of the universe, as Jesus spoke to his disciples there on the level plane, speak to us today. Bring your Holy Spirit to this place so that our hearts might be softened, our ears opened, and our eyes focused on you and your will for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, didn't I say last week that I really hated the text from last week? Well, this week, these 11 verses are so packed full of things, I could preach for them all six weeks of Lent and not get everything covered. But I'm going to just take one little line. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you in a good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. I want to talk about forgiveness. We live in an era where the media makes it hard to know what is true. You know, global pandemic, mass shootings, unrest on the borders of Ukraine, ongoing racial violence and sexual abuse scandals popping up on the nightly news on a regular basis. Maybe we can begin by making it clear what forgiveness is not. Debbie Thomas, she was actually a gymnast, but is now Director of Children and Family Ministries at St. Mark's Episcopal in Palo Alto. And she had a blog about this topic. And what she said is that forgiveness is not denial. Forgiveness isn't pretending that an offense didn't matter or that a wound doesn't hurt. Forgiveness isn't acting as if things don't have to change or allowing ourselves to be abused or mistreated because God wants us to forgive and forget, or assuming that God isn't interested in justice. Forgiveness isn't the same thing as healing or reconciliation. Healing has its own timetable, and sometimes reconciliation isn't possible. Sometimes our lives depend on us severing our ties with our offenders, even if we have forgiven them. And secondly, forgiveness isn't a detour or a shortcut. Yes, Christianity insists on forgiveness. But as we read in the Bible, it calls us first to mourn and lament, to burn with zeal, 
and a hunger and thirst for justice. Forgiveness in the Christian tradition isn't palliative. It doesn't soothe. It works hand in hand with that hard work of repentance and transformation. After all, there is nothing godly about responding to systemic evil with passive acceptance, as we have all seen. Theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer warns us that we should never allow forgiveness to de degenerate into cheap grace, described as the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, grace without the cross. And finally, it's good to know that forgiveness is not instantaneous. At least not for us humans, anyway. <laughs> not if we're being honest. Forgiveness is a process. It's messy. There's nothing straight about it. It's usually a bumpy process that leaves us sometimes feeling healed up and free, but then the next minute bleeding out of every pore. Thomas says that in her experience, no one who says the words, I forgive you, gets a pass from this messy process. And that no one who struggles extra hard to forgive for reasons of who they are, where they are in their lives right now, or what has happened to them in the past, should feel that they're less godly or spiritual than those who don't have that problem. Look at what it took for Joseph to forgive his brothers. He wrestled with a strong desire to shame and scare them. In fact, he did shame and scare them. <laughs> Forgiveness was something Joseph had to arrive at, slowly and painfully. There was no cathartic, striking, lightning moment when the hurts of his past slipped away and rolled off. There was only life lived one layered, complicated, and unsentimental moment at a time. Why? Because he, like us, was created for goodness. For just a nurturing world, for a family that could keep him safe. And just as Joseph did when we experience the good world being ripped out from under us, it's appropriate, it's human and healthy to react with horror. One of the great gifts of, spiritual, of Christianity when it's at its best is that it takes sin and sin's consequences very seriously. Sin wounds. Sin breaks. Sin can have consequences that last for years. And that's the thing. Jesus isn't offering us a simple set of rules by which to get by or get ahead in our world. But instead is inviting us into a whole other world. A world that is not about measuring and counting and weighing and competing and judging and paying back and hurting and hating. But instead, it's about love. Love for those who ha have loved you, but also love for those who haven't. Love even for those who hate you. That love get it gets expressed in all kinds of creative ways, but most often it comes through caring. Extended caring and compassion and help and comfort to those in need. And forgiveness, not paying back, but instead releasing one's claim on another and opening up a future where a relationship, you guessed it, of love is still possible. And so forgiveness isn't an elevator ride. It's a long staircase. We climb and we climb and we stop on a landing panting for breath trying to make some distance between that pain that we've suffered and this new life that we're looking for. And sometimes we can't tell if we've made any headway at all. We keep seeing that same broken landscape around us. But slowly, 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 our perspective changes. And slowly, 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 the ground of our pain falls away. And slowly, we rise. If forgiveness isn't denial or detour, or if forgiveness isn't quick, what is it? What is Jesus asking for us when he asks us to love, bless, pray, give, lend, do good, not judge, extend mercy, and to turn the other cheek? Henry Nouwen writes, 
Forgiveness is the name of love practiced among people who love poorly. And the hard truth is that all of us love poorly. (laughs) And so we need to forgive and be forgiven every day and every hour. Forgiveness is the great work of love among the fellowship of the weak that is our human family. And Dr. David Loos, one of my favorite theologians, (laughs) said in his website, in the meantime, forgiveness is a transformed way of seeing. When Joseph forgives his brothers, he reframes those horrible events of his life that includes now the redemptive artistry of God. God sent me before you to preserve life. To be clear, this doesn't mean that God willed Joseph's brothers to abuse and abandon him. I don't believe that abuse is ever God's plan or will for any of his children. Rather, what Joseph is saying is that God is always and everywhere in the business of making the worst things that happen to us and working on them for the purpose of multiplying wholeness and blessing for everyone. Because God is in the story, we can rest assured that it will not end in loss and trauma. There will always be another turn, another chapter, another path, another grace. Because Jesus promises his listeners that measure we will get back. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Because God loves us, we don't have to forgive in scarcity. We can forgive out of the amazing abundance of God. And that is our work, to love each other, forgive as we can, knowing that God makes things come well for all of us, because God loves us so much. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with our bidding prayers. And remember, after each petition, there's a pause if you'd like to add your own prayers. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. For the church universal, its ministry and the mission of the gospel, for the well-being of creation. For peace and justice in the world, the nations, and those in authority, and our community. Lord, I ask you to be with those homeless, especially those living in the forest when it's getting cold this week. May they find the warm place that they can be safe. For the poor, oppressed, sick, bereaved, and lonely, and those affected by the global pandemic and natural disasters. For all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. For our congregation and for our special concerns, we share now either silently or aloud. Lord, we have a few folks who received word this week of diagnoses that they didn't want to hear. We ask your healing hand on them from the top of their head to the tip of their toes. And may they feel your presence, their pe- your peace, and your support always. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And so, fa- friends, the peace of Christ be with you always. Please take this time to share God's peace with one another, remembering cold, fluid, COVID season. Be creative.
<laughs> and as you find your way back to your seat, I invite my usher to bring forward the offering at this time. Deb and Bruce, come up here. <laughs> This is something I do not want to do. I've told them they couldn't leave, but unfortunately, they can't listen to me. <laughs> you can stay right there. <laughs> they have made the decision that they need to go back to Minnesota, where it's so cold, <laughs> that because of family, and we all understand that, the family's important, but we also know that they will always be a part of us. So I have a little... Godspeed and farewell. Deb and Bruce, as you leave our congregation, we wish to bid you farewell. A reading from John. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ received you and made you members of his church. And when you came to this congregation, we rejoice to welcome you into the mission we share as the people of God. In this community, you have come to know and to share God's loving purpose for you and for all creation. God has blessed you in this community, and God has blessed us through you. We encourage you to continue to receive and share God's gifts in Lionel Lakes, Minnesota, united with us in the body of Christ and the mission that we share. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for Bruce and Deb and for the time that we have shared with them. As they've been a blessing to us, now bless, we now send them forth to be a blessing to others through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And we have for you, because you're going to need it. <laughs> so when you're freezing there in Minnesota, we want you to wrap this around yourself. And remember that you are mightily loved by us here at Emmanuel. And so, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the work and witness of your servants, Deb and Bruce, who have enriched this congregation and shared their gifts with their colleagues, friends, and family. Now bless and preserve them at this time of transition. Day by day, guide them and give them what is needed. Friends to cheer their way and a clear vision of that to which you are now calling them. By your Holy Spirit, be present in their pilgrimage, that they may travel with the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> All right. We'll let you go only because you really need it. <laughs> All right. Friends, God who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you and calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in today and forevermore. Amen. Oh, he's going to play. Stand up. Get your lights out. <laughs> Shine, let it shine. <laughs>
and share the good news. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Drum us out, bell choir. Thank <laughs> you.